Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Well, good evening and welcome to the CAF Warbird Tube episode four tonight. This is episode number 136. And tonight we take a look at the connections between World War II and Star Wars is going to be interesting. Now, before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, take a second to like, share, or subscribe, and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, also click that bell icon, and you'll get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube when they get posted. Now, Warbird Tube is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. To find out more about CAF, our events, our aircraft, local units, or how you, yes, you can join the fun, visit our website at commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you're watching tonight, you may have some uh, questions uh, that uh, come up. And if they do, just type them in the chat box and we'll try to answer them either during the presentation or before we sign off. Now, joining me tonight is uh, Dr. Allison Whitney. Dr. Whitney, welcome uh, to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's wonderful to be here. <laughs> well, good. And uh, just... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're uh, kind of experiencing some uh, some technical issues with uh, GoToWebinar tonight. So if you're <laughs> tuning in and things seem a little wonky, well, hey, it's the internet. What are you going to do? So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you, you came to create this presentation. So I'm an associate professor of film and media studies at Texas Tech. And uh, my research interests involve film genres, particularly science fiction. I'm also very interested in the history of film technology. Uh, for example, I'm working on a, a project on the history of IMAX cinema. And in terms of my teaching, I, uh, I teach a class on uh, war in cinema, particularly looking at nonfiction material like um, documentaries, but also things like training films, newsreels, that kind of material. And furthermore, I teach a class on Star Wars, which uh, is, given that there's over 40 years of Star Wars material in just about every medium, um, it makes a great subject for a media studies class. And so uh, I, I have been a, a lifelong Star Wars fan um, since I saw The Empire Strikes Back as a, as a wee thing. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to, to talk about all these intersecting interests with you. Excellent, well, let's, uh, let's dive right in. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna present today is a few different ways of thinking about the relationship between World War II and Star Wars, uh, particularly as it concerns uh, aviation. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, Star Wars is a huge media phenomenon. Uh, and the people who created Star Wars over the decades draw on all kinds of influences. Today, I'm gonna focus on the production of the original trilogy and particularly the first film from 1977. Um, and then later in my talk, I'm gonna comment on how a particular community connects this film to their own military history. So we'll start with this image that we're looking at right now. Um, this, if you are familiar with the Commemorative Air Force, this will be familiar to you. Um, uh, Fifi is a B-29 in the collection of the CAF. And as you can see, its cockpit has a very distinctive appearance. Now, of course, this, this window design was created for tactical purposes uh, to give the crew a large field of vision. But the look of this cockpit has, has become iconic. Uh, on an aesthetic level, there's an elegance to its geometry, uh, the combination of circular forms and these radiating lines make it attractive to look at. There's also, of course, its association with 
unprecedented military power, right? These were aircraft that allowed for long range and high altitude bombing mesh missions that would be decisive in the war, um, including the use of atomic weapons. And so this is a design that carries a lot of cultural weight. Now, if you're familiar with Star Wars, it has probably occurred to you looking at this that it looks a lot like what's on my next slide, which is the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. Uh, this is a production still from The Empire Strikes Back. So again, we have this sort of aesthetically pleasing geometric arrangement of windows. Uh, it's beautiful to look at, and it, it's clearly making a reference to uh, World War II aviation. Now, let's think for a minute about science fiction as a genre. Uh, science fiction stories typically speculate about the future. And one way of doing that is by taking familiar technologies and extrapolating from them, right? Imagining what they could be in the future and thinking about the implications of that. So for example, you take something we recognize like cars and then have a science fiction story with flying cars. So on one level, we might look at this design and say, okay, Star Wars is taking a, a familiar cockpit design and applying it to a spaceship. And of course, that's part of what's going on here. But in Star Wars, the relationship to time is somewhat different from other science fiction texts. Um, so in my next slide, you'll see something that is uh, familiar to Star Wars viewers. This is repeated at the beginning of, of every movie. And these opening words, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, very efficiently lay out Star Wars relationship to time. So it's a long time ago and, and an unspecified time in the past, not unlike the once upon a time of a fairy tale, but it's also in another galaxy, which brings to mind a, a space age sensibility that puts us in the more futuristic realm of science fiction and advanced technologies. So the Millennium Falcon cockpit design, it, it's not just a, a relic of World War II, but rather a design that gives the viewer a, a hint of something familiar that connotes the past, and then uses that to introduce us to something new. Now, if you listen to people's accounts of uh, seeing Star Wars for the first time, right back in the 70s, a, a common story is that it showed them not only things they had never seen before, but new ways of seeing. And those new ways of seeing often hinged on special effects. Now, anyone listening who is a big special effects enthusiast is probably thinking, well, special effects and visual effects are different things. And you're right. But for the moment, I'm using special effects as an umbrella term. And I'm happy to get into that in our, our Q&A. Um, so let's think about special effects for a minute. In my next slide, our characters, they get on board the Millennium Falcon and they make the jump to hyperspace. So this is one of those moments that's somewhat legendary in Star Wars lore for just blowing the audience away. Uh, there are stories of spontaneous applause uh, when this image came up on the screen. And of course, this is a special effect that looks really cool. Um, but let's think about what makes it so effective. Certainly, it fills the image um, and does so in a way that communicates enormous speed. So the stars that up until this point in the movie had just been points of light in the background suddenly turn into streaks of light. And so it, it really is a transformation of space. But another key to its effectiveness is the way that it is anchored in the geometry of this cockpit. Now, the filmmakers who made Star Wars are very creative folks, and if they wanted to, they could have figured out all sorts of other ways to, to visualize the hyperspace jump that would look really cool. But this one, it creates this amazing experience by almost lining up the geometric properties 
of the old and the new. So we have the, the aesthetic appeal and connotations of aerial power of a B-29. And then that becomes the foundation for a transformative visual experience of speed and movement when you combine it with the special effect. And on the next slide, you can just see a side-by-side -side com comparison of these images. So in this particular design decision about the Millennium Falcon with the cockpit and also the, the hyperspace jump, we can see this uniquely Star Wars-y relationship between the old and the new. And if we keep thinking about how this dynamic plays out in Star Wars special effects, um, there are some further connections that we can explore between World War II aviation and the space battles in Star Wars. Uh, but before I keep going, are, are there any questions or thoughts you wanna throw in or I can also just keep going? Uh, I know no we're having a few questions yet from the audience. But um, okay, yeah, so, okay. so far so good. Okay, so um, in the next image, so Star Wars introduced and perfected a number of techniques that were revolutionary for representing flight. So this image here is um, what we're what you're seeing here is the Dijkstra flex system. Um, on the crane over there, there's a, 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 a camera set up and there's a little TIE fighter model uh, in the middle in front of this blue screen. So the Dykes Reflex was a, a computer controlled camera system. And keep in mind that making anything computer controlled in the 1970s um, was more complicated than it is now. Um, the, the benefit of having this computer controlled system is it allowed for perfectly synchronized and, and repeatable camera movements um, when you were photographing models. And what this meant is that you could create more dynamic flying scenes than had ever been possible in, um, in cinema. And so this created a, a flexibility in movement that opened up a lot of creative possibilities. But the question is, well, what do, you, what do you do with these tools? The filmmakers needed to make decisions about the visual logic of space flight. What was it gonna look like? How was it gonna work? How were objects gonna move in relationship to one another? And also, how would that movement be comprehensible to the film viewer? Uh, don't forget that in space, there's no up and down. It's very hard to represent speed and scale without an earthly frame of reference. Uh, and so it's actually quite a, a, a difficult set of problems to figure out how to make space travel look like something and look like something that an audience could understand. As it turns out, the visual logic of space flight in these films, like the TIE fighter attack um, on the Millennium Falcon or the rebel fleet destroying the Death Star, it owes a great deal to films of and about World War II aviation. Uh, Paul Houston, who was a storyboard artist for the first Star Wars movie, tells a story about how Lucas would visualize what he wanted from the space battles by editing together aviation footage from World War II movies, both dramatic films, like Hollywood movies, and also newsreels. Um, on the next slide, you'll see uh, a, the poster for um, the Dam Busters. Uh, Star Wars fans, listening in, uh, will probably know that the attack run on the Death Star sequence is very similar to the climax of this movie, uh, which was released in 1955. Um, and indeed, the cinematographer for the Dam Busters, uh, Gilbert Taylor, also worked on Star Wars. So there's a very direct connection uh, between the, the sensibilities of World War II movies, um, both those made during the war and representations of it 
in its aftermath, um, and the way that Lucas and his colleagues were conceptualizing Star Wars. The you know, before I go any further, um, I mentioned newsreels, and I want to make a a point about newsreels. Um, so on on the next slide. Um, Newsreels were short films, typically shown in movie theaters before the main feature. When you went to the movies in the 1940s, there would be uh, a combination of cartoons, newsreels, serials. That's where you sh saw uh, just a portion of a story uh, that would be continued the next week. And then usually a, a double bill or even a triple bill of feature films. The so newsreels, they provided information um, about the war and certainly other topics. But an, an important thing to think about with newsreels is particularly during World War II, is they had a, a political purpose in creating a consumable, understandable narrative um, that was typically intended to maintain public support for the war effort. A popular technique for engaging audiences in stories about the, the relative power of military forces was to uh, lean on footage taken of and from airplanes. So displays of aerobatic capabilities um, and also the novelty of aerial views, right? Looking down on the landscape from above made for exciting content. The image we're seeing here is the title card from a newsreel. And you'll notice that the background is this patriotic airplane eagle hybrid uh, illuminated by spotlights. So it makes it very clear what the big attraction is for audiences in watching this newsreel. Uh, on my next slide, um, now this is a, an image from 1940. So it is before the US entered, entered the war, but I think it, makes an important point about newsreel representations of the military. This is a newspaper ad and its purpose was to um, both encourage theaters to show the March of Time, which is a particular brand of newsreels, and also encourage potential audiences to seek out these newsreels when they were deciding where to go to the movies, right? Or go to your local theater and say, hey, I want to see the March of Time. And what I want us to notice here is that in this newsreel about the new US Navy, the most prominent feature is the airplanes. Um, you know, there's a few ships, but they're kind of in the background. And what's implied here is that this newsreel is going to be visually exciting thanks to these aircraft. Now, it's important to understand that both newsreels and um, Hollywood movies made during the war, um, and indeed a lot of military films made outside of wartime, um, were created with military cooperation and oversight. So they were integrated with uh, the propaganda messaging of the time. And with that in mind, uh, on the next slide, we're just gonna zoom into a, a statement in this advertisement. Um, and I think it sums up an important point about the function of newsreels or what they considered um, the, the thing that they could offer. So the, the March of Time, this is sort of in the center, the March of Time um, is the one motion picture feature that com compounds the world's significant news into complete understandable, sense-making stories. So this newsreel is gonna offer thrilling images that arise from the, in this case, the rapid acceleration of aeronautical design, but they also offer those images in ways that make military narratives comprehensible to wide audiences. And let's hang on to that point about sense-making. Um, and to ask ourselves, what is it about World War II aviation that was so critical to the people creating Star Wars? Um, they were, you know, planning this film in the mid-1970s. 
Um, why not take more inspiration from the, the war planes of that period, which were, you know, faster, more technologically advanced, capable of different kinds of maneuvers. You know, why, why go back to these points of reference from 30 years prior? I think that one of the reasons is that those World War II materials, they worked well as a foundation for Star Wars, not only for aesthetic reasons, but also because of this sense making that they achieved so effectively. Um, now, I'm aware that what I'm, I'm about to say could use a lot of unpacking from both a, a military history and a media history point of view. Um, but when it comes to wars of the 20th century and the kind of public imagery created of and through those conflicts, um, particularly during the war, World War II narratives, and especially in newsreels, provided this wealth of material that tended to uh, downplay moral ambiguity. What I mean is their underlying message was that, and here I'm talking from a sort of allied perspective, was that the defeat of fascism was morally necessary. Now, to be clear, I am not saying that World War II lacked moral complexity, not at all. But newsreels did not typically invite you to empathize with the enemy or to question the use of resources in the war effort. With later conflicts like Korea or Vietnam, uh, the political context and also the media production and consumption patterns were very different. And they presented conflict in terms that um, were less likely or less easily um, presented things in simple black and white terms. Now, having said that, those conflicts certainly have their influences in Star Wars as well. But when it comes to the way World War II movies tended to present aerial combat in particular, they would do so with a level of moral certainty that was quite compatible with Star Wars worldview. Star Wars, specifically in the original trilogy, trilogy is a world where the distinctions between light and dark, good guys and bad guys are very clear. Star Wars fans listening now might be thinking, but wait a minute, what about, what about the Clone Wars? And what about Andor? Things like that. And it's true that in the ensuing decades, Star Wars productions have introduced all sorts of moral complexity. But it's safe to say that in the 1970s, when Lucas was conceptualizing Star Wars, World War II newsreels were formative, not only for the way they showed airplanes making thrilling maneuvers, but also for the sense making of warfare um, and the way they assigned or could be used to assign unambiguous moral qualities to warring factions and even to the look and sound of war machines. Um, so on, our, on the next slide, we just have an image of a couple of X-wings um, in, in the trench on their way to uh, destroy the Death Star. One of the remarkable things about um, these space flight sequences in A New Hope is that even though things are moving very fast, uh, the editing strategies are quite complex, objects seem to converge from all directions, but it's also surprisingly simple for the viewer to keep track of, of who's who. The way that the spaceships move, the differentiated sounds they make, so X-wings tend to make more palatable airplane noises, uh, whereas TIE fighters scream. All of this makes it clear which side you should root for. Um, nothing about the sequence, this particular sequence, the way it plays out, um, makes you, for example, contemplate the tragic fate of Imperial pilots, right? That's not the kind of... Uh, moral equations that this sequence presents. 
So Star Wars, it draws upon World War II aviation and the ways it was used cinematically to integrate the, the sensory experience of the viewer with the themes and storytelling of the movie. And this is a big part of why Star Wars had such a transformative impact on its audiences. Now, another thing I'd like to point out here is that the, the significance and the, the impact of these uh, World War II points of reference, they are partly contingent on the, the audience watching the film, right? What, what kind of point of view they have. So making a World War II reference in 1977, when the war was only 32 years ago, meant that you were drawing upon the living memory of a large portion of the audience. And those audience members would have memories of the war itself, but also of the images that these filmmakers were referencing. So again, there would be this level of familiarity, trans uh, balanced rather with this transformed way of seeing that the, the special effects were offering. And this dynamic would of course play out differently for viewers depending on their age and their cultural context. So in uh, certainly in Star Wars fan communities, um, it can be interesting to talk about people's sort of first exposure to Star Wars and how they connected it to um, to their own experience and to you know what, what was going on in their particular moment and the kind of experiences they had had. To elaborate on that point, I want to share an example of a, a particular community's reception of Star Wars within the framework of their own military history. Um, on the next slide, this is the story of Navajo Star Wars. So, um, Star Wars A New Hope had a special release in 2013, um, where the film was translated and dubbed into the Navajo language. This was a project of the Navajo Nation Museum. Uh, their director, Manuelito Wheeler, um, and his wife, Dr. Jennifer Wheeler, who is a a Navajo language specialist, they had this idea to create a version of the film with a Navajo dialogue track. Um, after years of work, they managed to convince Lucasfilm to partner with them on this and create uh, an official version of the movie in the Navajo language. Uh, here, this is a screen grab of where you can find this film on Disney+. Plus. Um, in order to get to it, you go to A New Hope, and um, Navajo is not in the main language option, but if you go into the extras section under A New Hope and scroll along, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, and P.S., they did this with Finding Nemo as well, um, and more recently, A Fistful of Dollars. So this is a, an ongoing project. Navajo Star Wars was part of... Uh, a, a long-term language education and revitalization project. So the idea was to use much loved popular culture films as a way of encouraging uh, use of the Navajo language alongside more formal school and community-based language education. This film has been hugely popular, not only with Navajo audiences, but also with people who don't speak Navajo, like people outside that community. Um, and I, I highly recommend watching it in Navajo. It's a very interesting experience. Uh, when I, in my teaching, when I teach my Star, Star Wars class, uh, I ask my students to watch this and they are always uh, really fascinated by it. One of the interesting consequences of this translation is that it has opened the door for Navajo audiences to make culturally specific interpretations of the film. So, for example, there, there's an important narrative in Navajo storytelling about uh, hero twins. Um, these are sort of important cultural figures. 
you can probably guess how they relate that to Star Wars. Uh, but for our purposes today, I want to highlight a connection to a specific part of Navajo military history, that of the Navajo code talkers. Um, on the next slide, we have a, a photo of some code talkers. There's a long history of the US military using Native American languages in cryptography. So members of indigenous groups who were in the military were often recruited to use their languages as the foundation for codes. There were code talkers from many languages, including uh, Comanche, Hopi, and, and others. Uh, in the Canadian military, there were Cree code talkers. So this was a fairly wide practice on this continent. Um, now, the grim irony is that because of colonialist practices that tried to destroy native languages, uh, there were very few speakers. Uh, furthermore, at this time, few of these languages had a written form. And so part of the, the tactical strategy was that it was extraordinarily unlikely that enemy armies would have any uh, frame of reference for these languages, um, thus making them effectively unbreakable codes. So in World War II, the Marine Corps um, tasked Navajo members with creating a code based in their language. And again, the idea was that the Japanese would have no point of reference for Navajo vocabulary or grammar, so it was um, basically unbreakable. And this would become a very effective means of communication um, that was instrumental in many battles. I cannot overstate the importance of the code talkers and how the Navajo community thinks about their relationship to World War II and to the military more broadly. It's a, a fascinating story in itself, but it's also a story that very effectively makes the point of how important language and culture are to sovereignty and survival. Now, earlier, I spent a lot of time talking about the, the rebels' attack on the Death Star and all the ways it connects to World War II imagery. When Star Wars is screened in Navajo for Navajo audiences, uh, one thing that happened is that many members of the community connected that particular sequence to the history of the code talkers. Now, of course, the whole movie is dubbed into Navajo. So what's special about that scene? Well, it turns out that it was the experience of hearing the language, um, speaking dialogue, about military strategy, so you know, using military terminology, combined with hearing it as though over the radio, right? So with the particular sound quality of um, that scene in Star Wars. And that combination of factors drew this, this vivid connection to the Code Talker history. Um, on the next slide, we uh, you can see an example of how this connection has been uh, elaborated on by other Navajo artists, uh, for example, in this work by Dale DeForest. Um, so I know I've, I've gone over a whole bunch of ideas. Are there, I think I should pause here. Are there any questions or comments? Um, what I, I think uh, as, as we're going through this and I'm relating my own experience to um, you know, being one of those those people who was in the in the theaters in in 1977 and saw the the very first release, and now that you're talking about some of these the references, especially the aerial references, um, it, it starts to make more sense, I guess, in 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 my mind, and maybe not in anyone else's, but how that movie really really struck a, a chord um, and, and really became something that. I'll, I'll admit it. I went back to the theater probably seven or eight times to see to see it uh, in the theater. Of course, there was no streaming in those days, so that that was the only thing you had. But there was something about that movie that drew me in, and 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 maybe it's partially uh, you know having always been fascinated by flight, especially World War II aviation. But as you were talking about, especially the the uh, the, the cockpit scenes, like and and the newsreels as well, as kind of 
bringing that bringing that all back together and, and that that sort of not comfort, but it was something that you're familiar with that just I think resonated with me and, and I would think with with a lot of other people. Uh, kind of a, a long and rambling uh, comment there with without really a question, but it's just amazing how as you were talking about it, it all those thoughts are swirling around and it's like, wow, this this is this is really fascinating. And and certainly, you know, the things we're talking about today are are just just one of many top one of many factors that that create mm-hmm. that experience. Uh, there's a, a film scholar. Sorry about my dog. Um, there's a film <laughs> scholar named Scott uh, Catman who um, has described Star Wars as something that you don't so much watch as you inhabit. Um, and the I think that part of what makes the uh, the visual experience and also the sound design so engaging is this, you know, very kind of delicate relationship between the the familiar and the new. Um, so you're, you're mentioning having, you know, a kind of feeling of, of comfort watching Star Wars. Um, one of the things that the the opening scroll does is it it looks a lot like uh, the beginning of movie serials. I mentioned that briefly uh, in my presentation, um, and yeah, there there you go. Um, so again, the way serials worked is as in an effort to keep audiences coming back to the movies, um, they would have these stories in you know, short episodes, 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, this is a, um, this one, I think, is this, this is, it's Flash Gordon or it's the other guy. Um, anyway, and they would start out yeah, with Flash, this scroll Flash basically Gordon. to get, you, okay. <laughs> um, and it would get you caught up on what had happened before. Um, and of course, you know, um, I carefully chose chapter four to uh, to use in this example, given that Star Wars begins in the middle of the story, right? So it, it, mm-hmm. it begins in this way that's sort of like an old serial that some of the audience would remember from when they were kids. Um, but also, of course, it presents it in this very different way, right? Um, with different kinds of special effects and um, different sound quality and things like that. So the uh so yeah it's and and you know picking up on the uh my story about you know navajo audiences and their relationship um to well to star wars generally and to the the navajo version um you know this is a great example of that community connecting things in their own history that were not intentionally part of the original film but there's sort of, there's things about Star Wars that allow for this kind of uh, relationship between the future and the past that people you know find very compelling. Yes, it, you mentioned uh, audio, which just uh, triggered a, 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 another memory, and that is um, uh, at the uh, EIA Museum in, in Oshkosh, there's a model of the Millennium Falcon with a plaque from the producers of Star Wars, who had, they actually came to the EIA convention in probably 75 or 76 and recorded the sounds of warbird aircraft that were then, yeah. you know, with different mixing and everything else that helped to mm-hmm. uh, form some of the, the, the audio, the, the, the sound of the aircraft flying through space. So uh, again, using that, that World War II uh, connection and that sound that most of us are, are familiar with, and changing it a little bit, but bringing back something that that was very familiar. Yes, absolutely. And you know, one of the things that allowed for that kind of innovation in in sound um, was a combination of of technological changes that allowed for high quality recording, um, basically out in the wild uh, for for a. a a good chunk of the history of audio, the only way to get a, a really high quality recording was in a studio. Um, and with uh, developments in um, 
audio equipment that you could just take out in the world, it, it kind of opened up the possibilities for using sounds from all kinds of sources and also recording them in different kinds of spaces. And so um, a lot of the, again, sounds in Star Wars are you know, recordings of familiar things, but recorded in, in new ways, manipulated in new ways to make them um, to have this you know, alien quality, but something that still kind of hangs on to something recognizable. Um, and that, you know, going back to the, the aviation sounds in particular, part of what lets us know, you know, which, which spaceships are the good guys is that they sound enough like airplanes that we're familiar with. Um, and that kind of, you know, let, lets an audience member who might be too young to follow the plot um, still know, oh yeah, those are the good guys. Cause I know what that sounds like. I want to circle back to something that you had mentioned earlier, um, and that's the difference between visual and, and special effects. And give you a chance to kind of expound on that a little bit. So um, a the reason I'm pausing is this, this is a complicated thing, but um, <laughs> a way of explaining it is uh, special effects are things that you put in front of the camera or things that happen during filming. So special effects would include things like uh, puppets or camera tricks or, um, you know, prosthetic makeup. Um, it could also include use of models, uh, miniatures, things like that. Visual effects are typically things done in what's called post-production. So, uh, you know, you, you filmed your material and then you go back and you um, add other effects to, to the image. Um, now, these things have to work together, right? So the, the visual effects people and the special effects people have to be talking to one another. Um, and the... But in terms of the, well, both the special and the visual effects in Star Wars, um, some of the reasons that it was so innovative is, well, I mentioned the Dykes Reflex, right? These computer controlled cameras that allowed you to use models in more uh, intricate ways. But also um, Lucas and his colleagues were very aware of and interested in the experimental film scene. Um, and we're open to uh, new techniques, such as, for example, some of the very first uh, computer animation, um, which we see in the the planning for the um, the planning for the Death Star run in when they're having that briefing. Uh, some of those images are actually computer generated, um, and that was coming from a kind of experimental media scene at that time. Um, so now one thing I would say is that, and this is going kind of beyond uh, A New Hope, which is the movie I've been focusing on, but it's interesting to see how things have evolved in terms of how we talk about special effects uh, and visual effects. Um, for example, I'm, I'm sure that you've heard, say, movie stars, film producers talk about how they, they use practical effects in their filmmaking. And what they mean by practical effects are um, basically things that don't involve computer generated images. Um, and this is something where that, that distinction is often, um, shall we say, fictional. Um, it's a, a distinction that um, doesn't really take into account the complexity of, of film production, but a lot of it is uh, an effort to kind of appeal to people's ideas about special effects from the period of the original Star Wars. 
um, there's a kind of uh, aesthetic to these movies that um, highlights the fact that they're they're using uh, physical objects, but in in new ways. And even so, even contemporary special effects where you know there's elaborate CGI um, happening will kind of present itself in a way that connects to the aesthetics of um, of movies like like Star Wars from the the 70s and 80s. I realize this is a whole other tangent, but but it it is uh, it, it is amazing how 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 deep you can go uh, without trying very hard uh, to uh, <laughs> to examine and, and kind of and kind of pull all this apart. I mean, you know, for for the most part, you know, seeing the movie for the first time, it was like, wow, this is really cool. But now, several years later, you start you know really pulling apart what was happening on the screen, and and also you know, something you mentioned earlier with uh, with newsreels is that there weren't technically propaganda, but they were definitely sliding toward that um and and especially with, with some of the movies that came out of hollywood uh, during the war they're obviously just like star wars you had the good guys and the bad guys and you know who you knew which side was which there's no there was no question about that so it was uh it's just interesting as you start pulling everything apart and, and i think that that um at least the sort of appearance of of moral mm -hmm. simplicity was part of what was appealing about Star Wars and and is comforting about it. Um, and because, you know, the mid 70s was was not a time of moral simplicity, let's say that. Um, yeah. And so the there was something, you know, comforting about that, that kind of escape. Um, now, in the decades since, folks have raised all kinds of good questions about hmm what what are the implications of blowing up a space station that probably has millions of people on it things like that um sure and that is certainly worth discussing and and it's important to think about how a film like star wars um and a kind of creative universe like star wars the way that it is able to to gloss over things like that um you know that that is worth thinking about um but and you know it's it's also worth thinking about that in terms of as i said the the strategies they used in terms of which sources of influence to um to capitalize on right and to uh, associate mm -hmm. themselves with yeah well and and speaking of of inspirations um one of our uh, viewers is wondering if uh, you could kind of discuss the the inspiration behind the uniforms uh, and the similarities to some uniforms of World War II, yeah, that's right. Um, so there's a lot of influences. Um, a one that's particularly striking is, of course, the imperial uniforms are very much inspired by um, uniforms of the Third Reich. And so certainly the the look of officers' uniforms, but also in a more uh, perhaps a more abstract way, the the uniforms of the stormtroopers. Now, for one thing, the fact that they're called stormtroopers is clearly a reference to uh, to Nazi stormtroopers, right? Um, but there's also a way that uh, stormtrooper uniforms are a a, a manifestation of really fascist ideals. Um, if you look at stormtrooper armor, it for one thing is it's dehumanizing, right? It sort of makes everybody the same. Um, it tr and and it's also designed in a way that is meant to appear threatening. Um, Anyone who is a cosplayer and has worn a stormtrooper uniform will tell you how difficult it is to sit down in one, um, right? These are not uniforms designed really for functional terms, but rather for creating a frightening image. Um, they are, 
um, even the the look of the helmet has a, a kind of skull like appearance. Um, and so this this it's a way of both you know connecting to obviously the the, the real world reference point of the Third Reich, but also uh, kind of elaborating upon that um, in a way that is it well sort of more abstract but also curiously more literal um yeah. there's other design elements of uh of star wars and i think i think in some of my extra images here um there's an image from a nazi propaganda film um i can't remember it's yeah there we go um so another thing that many people noted with star wars is that it makes use of um or takes inspiration from nazi propaganda uh this is an image from uh triumph of the will by lenny riefenstahl and this uh so this is the nuremberg rally this was an extraordinarily effective propaganda film um and if you actually read uh, American and British accounts of basically their own propaganda filmmakers, they they had this uh, paradox to deal with where they wanted to be as effective or more effective than this kind of imagery, but also they were afraid of that kind of power. Anyway, um, so this kind of, you know, these are vivid images and ones that when it comes to the imperial imagery function as a kind of, you know, shorthand for evil, right? These are the bad guys. One of the things that's concerning though, and we can go to the, the other image from, from Star Wars. There we go. Um, this is from the, these are the rebels. Uh, and this is their, their, award ceremony at the end of the movie where um, they're giving medals to, to Luke and Han uh, for blowing up the Death Star. And certainly in the 70s and ever since, people have pointed out that there's a, a kind of troubling uh, connection here in the, the composition of this scene um, with the, the fascist imagery. Um, and it's like, wait a second, these are these are supposed to be the the good the good guys. Um, now, this is something where there's a lot of different interpretations of the implications of this. Um, some folks look at this and think, hmm, maybe this is a a bit of a cautionary tale, right? It's like, well, you 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 won this battle, but uh, where where do you go next from here, and what might you be? What what should you be cautious about, right? When it comes to amassing more and more military power, um, others say, "Well, this is a perhaps a more careless use of what is, you know, a powerful aesthetic." Um, and you know, maybe Lucas should have thought about this more carefully um, in making his film. And but I think what we can say is this points to a uh, perhaps a larger question in how Star Wars makes use of these uh, points of reference from you know real world history. The there are lots of you know images, sounds, designs throughout these movies that reference other things or other in, uh, incidents, but they don't do it, it comprehensively. So, uh, you know, Star Wars is not strictly a meditation on the implication of World War II newsreels, say. Um, it's, it's taking things from a lot of different sources and recombining them into something new. And I think that this can and should lead to some debates about the implications, right, of making these references. Um, so, you know, going back to the, the first images we looked in, uh, looked at in this presentation, um, 
the you know the reference to the B29 in a spaceship that is owned by a smuggler who ends up joining the rebellion that's that's a different kind of story from the way that something like a B29 gets manufactured right um so Again, these things can lead to a certain level of uh, of complexity or perhaps inconsistency. Um, but in some ways, that's part of what makes Star Wars such an interesting text um, in that it allows for some quite wide ranging interpretations. It certainly does. And for some interesting conversations as well. For, for sure. In the uh, couple of moments that uh, we have left, any uh, final thoughts before we wrap up tonight? Um, well, like I said, I encourage everyone to go watch Navajo Star Wars. It is um, a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, as you're watching, I encourage you to to think about the code talkers, right? And, uh, and perhaps think about some of the ways that your own... Um, your own experiences, right? Your own point of view um, inform the way that you watch not only Star Wars, but all kinds of movies. Excellent. Dr. Whitney, uh, again, we appreciate you taking time to, uh, to share your insights with us uh, tonight. It was uh, fascinating. I didn't know where we were going uh, tonight. I knew we, were, <laughs> we had two great topics, World War II aviation and Star Wars coming together. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, sharing your, your thoughts with us tonight. It, uh, for me, it was fun. I hope for our audience as well. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, Good. thanks for having me. Excellent. And for those of you joining us tonight, thank you again. Uh, don't forget to click the uh, like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about future shows. And uh, again, if you have any ideas for uh, topics you'd like us to explore or any feedback about our shows, just send Leah Block an email at media at cafhq.org. Again, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Whitney. And until next time, I'm Steve Buss for the Commemorative Air Force. Have a good night.